All right. Uh, hello, everybody. This is a week four lecture of a psych uh, 3280 in your basic consciousness. Um, this week is going to be the introduction to the visual systems. Okay, so just let's get started with the recap of the week three. Uh, I uh, first um, discuss about uh, the role of the brain lesions in consciousness research. And then um, in particular, I introduced the brain lesion patients phenomenology and their behaviors. And uh, uh, in terms of the example, I first discussed and also uh, showed the movie example of the locked in syndrome people who couldn't, um, who basically can't move uh, uh, anything about their body except for their uh, eye and eye blink and so eye movement sometimes. And uh, uh, we show we looked at the uh, uh, video of the butterfly and the bell, uh, uh, diving butterfly and the bell. And then uh, I, uh, we also looked at uh, our patients who were discovered to have no cerebellum, but uh, didn't have much uh, impairment throughout her life. And then uh, uh, prefrontal cortex. So uh, we discussed about a guy who uh, got uh, speared uh, their you know, left, uh, left to right um, prefrontal cortex uh, bilaterally. And although uh, he had some uh, um, social interaction programs, but he seems to be intact in terms of sensory experience. And then uh, finally, uh, we discussed about the, the blind side uh, patient who had an lesion in a, a primary visual cortex mainly, and then um, demonstrated their various interesting behaviors and also um, interesting phenomenological reports. And uh, in particular, uh, blind sight patients claim that they do not uh, experience anything visual. So that's their phenomenological behavior, uh, you know, reports. However, they, their behavior, especially the localization behaviors, are quite intact. And that's the dissociation between the phenomenology and the behaviors. And this is a, a key figure from last week, um, GUI is a patient who is termed as a relative uh, blindside uh, person. Relative because um, his uh, blindside behavior happens only at a certain range of the uh, contrast, uh, uh, stimulus strengths or luminance contrast. And uh, uh, we also talk about absolute blind uh, blindside this week again, but in his case, it hits a uh, relative blindside. And then um, these uh, two sets of the bars here is uh, two different experimental situations when um, experimenters change the frequency of the stimuli. But uh, even though the stimulus of, uh, presented in the blind hem field was uh, quite frequent, 20%, uh, the uh, high contrast stimulus, such as 30% or 46% stimulus, was almost always uh, not detected and reported as absent here. That's the correct rejection component here. And I notice that uh, in the intact field, they, uh, he was able to uh, detect 3% stimulus, 100% accuracy. So 30 or 46% is much, much stronger stimulus, but he still denies seeing. Okay? And then the right side figure shows that the uh, report of seeing something that is a uh, white, uh, square, there's some kind of fluctuation. And the black is the key here. It's the accuracy of the localization judgment. So here, um, the test was to present an, uh, two uh, possible location of, uh, for, for the target. And then uh, blindsided patients were asked to locate which box contained the target. Okay, and then if you just ask them what they see, especially for the stimulus such as 38 or 46, then they just would say that, no, I don't see anything. But if you ask them to choose either one of these, then they can say, they can just point it, touch it at an accuracy of 80% or more. Okay? The right side is the accuracy or uh, proportion of the trial where they saw, uh, they reported seeing something. So here, uh, the 
chance conformance is 50% and uh, they were correct at 80%. It's a dissociation, okay? So in this week, uh, following from this uh, blind side uh, discussion, what we are gonna do is to introduce a way to validate phenomenological reports of uh, blind side patients through consideration of metacognitive accuracy. And a metacognition is a concept and uh, uh, no, it, you can consider it as a knowledge on one's, on one's own consciousness. And then uh, we also introduce a basic architecture of visual system, focusing on the uh, structure and function of the eyes. And then uh, we will follow uh, and also uh, build more knowledge uh, based on the uh, visual system from the next week uh, further. So uh, learning objective wise, uh, it's uh, going to be the following. Uh, first, what are the behavior and the neural signature of non-conscious processing? So blind sight behavior is uh, quite uh, surprising on its own, but uh, I haven't actually explained what's actually happening in most of our uh, non normal people's uh, unconscious behavior. So once you understand what we can do, uh, with the non-conscious processing, it will become even more surprising why um, blind side behavior can happen. And then uh, to back up whether uh, the uh, back up the argument whether blind side behaviors are just a, a consequence of lines or insensitive kind of um, uh, methods, we first uh, uh, review further evidence whether uh, blind side behaviors can be induced by monkeys. And there, uh, the experiments are much more carefully controlled and uh, um, we can do uh, more interesting uh, experiments and also to understand better. So then uh, uh, we'll discuss what are the evidence of the blind side behavior in monkeys. And then uh, after establishing the uh, difference between the standard non-conscious behavior and the blind side behavior, and also confirming that blind side is a uh, reliable, replicable behaviors, we uh, go to this. Uh, we are going to discuss how we can discriminate non-conscious from conscious behaviors using the concept of the metacognition. And then towards the end of the lecture uh, today, uh, we are going to uh, discuss how is uh, what, what is the structure of the eye and how does it shape our conscious vision and uh, this is a relatively big topic so it's likely to go span across the, uh, into the next lecture so uh, in terms of the reading material it's uh, the, especially the last one is going to be covered by uh, chapter three of the quest for consciousness and if uh, we can't cover everything this week then uh, we will uh, not assign any reading material for the next week. Okay, so uh, we'll start in the next video. Okay, so uh, let's get started on the first one, uh, non-conscious behaviors and uh, your activity in the normal uh, people. Um, let's get started from the reviewing uh, the backward masking. So here's the example of the backward masking. And if it doesn't work, then I recommend you to play it again uh, on your uh, browser, okay? Initially, you see A without mask, and you don't see it with a strong mask uh, with brief you know, interval. And then now you start to see something before the mask. And then uh, I hope most of the people start to see E. And then here um, it's N and so on. But if you stop um, the uh, frame at some point, then you'll see that you know, A was presented in this frame. And then uh, even at this uh, very fast one, you can see that you know, it was, yeah, presenting K before the mask, okay? So, the backward masking is a phenomenon where you see you are shown a briefly a very brief stimulus followed by strong high contrast stimulus following afterwards. And then the 
things that comes afterwards erase the conscious experience of the first, and then you see only the mask. That's the uh, basic phenomenon of the backward mask. The study that we are going to take a look at in a, a detail is the study done by Stan Dehain uh, roughly 20 years ago. This is a, a, masked, uh, a, a masking combined with the neuroimaging, uh, fMRI and EEG, as well as uh, some behavior testing. So that's a very good study. Okay. And uh, as you will see, uh, Stan Dehain has since then uh, proposed a uh, uh, particular theory called the Global Neuronal Workspace Theory, which is uh, uh, something that we will discuss um, this uh, lecture towards uh, maybe two to three weeks uh, from now um, as a sort of the guiding principle of the, uh, many of the consciousness research right now. It's one of the uh, most strong proponent, uh, um, so the strong theories available right now. Okay, so in this experiment, there were four conditions in any given trial. Okay, so this is very, in a sense, complicated design, but you need to understand it, of four conditions. Two conditions are this visible word or a visible blank condition. And in this condition, they use the masking, uh, but uh, not only the backward masking, that is meaning that uh, some kind of target presented and afterwards there is a mask, okay? Not only that, they also presented forward mask here. So the perception here is that the, you see a bunch of uh, meaningless things, symbols, followed by the blank of 71 milliseconds. Then in the visible world condition, you see lion or some kind of other letters in French uh, for 29 milliseconds, followed by nothing again, blank, and then mask, mask. So this is a visible world condition. Visible blank condition is mask to mask, nothing, 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 and then mask, mask. Okay, that's two conditions. Third condition is a masked word condition. And here, mask, first forward mask is followed by nothing, then mask, then stimulus, then mask, and then nothing. Okay, so this means that the uh, there is some kind of uh, mask that becomes transitory, invisible, you know, blank, and then mask. And then instead of be becoming uh, blank, transitory, yeah, they show the stimulus and then followed quickly by the mask. And then this so-called so so sandwich masking turns out to be very, very strong. And so that uh, because of the combination of forward and the backward masking, and this is very, very difficult to see. Anything is invisible. And then, so uh, instead of showing any target, they also included a trial where nothing is presented, blank is present. Okay. So there are four different conditions in this experiment. Now, uh, the behavior result. The first one is the experiment uh, conducted before the fMRI experiment. So subjects are presented on display and then uh, watching a continuous stream of 70, uh, 37 visible words and also 37 masked words and then 37 control blank trials. And then all of them are appearing in the random order. And then uh, each of them are uh, separated in two seconds, okay? And then uh, whenever, uh, whenever, wait a sec. So just to make sure, 37 trials, 37 trials, and the 37 trials, and then in a random order, and then uh, with some interval. And then within this first experiment, when they thought they, that the word was uh, presented in that interval, within this two seconds interval, they are asked to name it aloud. Okay? And then if they felt unable to name it, then uh, just say no. But uh, uh, that if they were felt that they saw something, but they couldn't name it, then they would just say that, oh, I saw it, but without any identification. So it's one particular experiment with two potential response. One is that, you know, naming, oh, I saw note, uh, lion, uh, and so on, okay? 
or I couldn't see it, but I couldn't identify it uh, as a, a particular word, but I saw something. So that is, uh, would be you know, the um, thing in front, French. Okay, all of this verbal response was uh, is going to you know contaminate the response in fMRI. So uh, they just did it you know before fMRI outside of the fMRI scanner, and then the result is the following. So this error bar is across subjects. Okay, uh, in the visible condition, then uh, they said that you know uh, either they identified the word, so this is a word naming thing, which is uh, this you know performance, or uh, a little bit of a scene response, you know. Um, and this is relatively a frequent things, uh, frequent finding, and uh, uh, some of your uh, general crop paper might uh, touch upon it. But in general, when people see things, they are always so, uh, usually able to uh, identify things. And in the case of the word, that's the case. So they see it, and then they are able to identify it. That's the uh, visible uh, word condition. And then the masked condition case, uh, almost 0%, they even detected and also couldn't uh, name it. And in the case of the blank, um, uh, this is a sort of the control for the false alarm rate. Even though nothing was presented, somebody might say, oh, I saw it. So, but in this case, you know, almost nobody, or in no, in no trials, they uh, reported this you know, uh, false alarm. So this is the first, uh, uh, important, you know, um, two measures of one experiment of the behavior. Okay. So now going to the next. And then after fMRI session, so fMRI session is going to be just in a passive viewing of, you know, those uh, three conditions or four conditions, you know, visible word, the visible blank, uh, invisible uh, masked, uh, masked word, and a masked blank. And then repeated many, many times. Um, Okay. And then participants were shown again with us each of the 37 uh, visible words. And then um, and 37 must words. And then 37 distractors that have never been presented before. Okay, that's the problem. Uh, that's an important thing in a random order. And then here they uh, excluded the possibility that the things were just invisible because of um, you know too short duration so here they showed it all unlimited time okay so then uh, they decided whether uh, or not the word has been presented before or meaning you know um, uh, before that experiment you know fmri session okay and so then uh, what they reported was that okay in the case where uh, people were shown both you know um, uh, lion in the visible world condition, in the pre-fMRI condition, they would say, oh yes, I saw it before. And that uh, accuracy was quite high, like 85%. And then in the case of the masked uh, um, word, like lion, that's very low, uh, like two to 3%. So presented as a masked word, you know, which was not visible you know, in the first place, it was also recorded, reported later on. No, I, I, I saw it, you know, very uh, low uh, probability. And then distractors such as, let's say, you know, uh, mountain or turtle, which was not presented in the uh, before fMRI experiment, that was also uh, reported as seen, but uh, at the same rate as this mask. So this is very important. You know, it, it measures a catch a trial performance, okay? And then after all of this, a uh, final experiment happened for the forced choice experiment. That's also important. And then the forced choice experiment, each of the 37 trials, first they show this uh, brief things like an you know, either masked word or masked blank, uh, masked word or uh, visible word, um, okay? Ah, sorry. In this case, uh, actually, it's always a single mask word. So it's, uh, you know, mask, blank, mask, then uh, followed by a short presentation of the uh, word, and then directly following mask, and then blank, and then mask. And that's one, you know, chunk of that single stream. So after, right after this, you know, single uh, short stream of the mask word, then 
participants were told about the presence of the hidden uh, world. So they were told always, actually, you know, there is a world. And then asked to select among the two choices presented at the left uh, or right uh, of the fixation. So they would be uh, shown very, very free uh, lion mask. And then on the left side, there is a lion. On the right side, there is maybe turtle. And then you choose which one was presented just before. So there is no memory confirmed here. And then the performance here is a 15% chance. Okay, that's the uh, third and the fourth measurement of the behavior measure of this experiment. So now uh, I'm going to go through this, uh, all the four results using a signal detection terms. Okay, and this is, uh, let's uh, focus on this uh, visible uh, world condition. And the visible world condition, you can use this visible performance and also uh, blank performance as a false alarm and also hit rate. So here, hit rate is 90% and the false alarm rate is almost 0%, so it locates around here. And that's more like you know, D prime of four or area under the curve of one. It's a perfect performance, okay? And then while the naming case, we don't have that uh, similar kind of uh, measurement, so we'll just remove or uh, ignore for now. And then now the recognition memory performance. So here, the performance of the correct hit is slightly lower, like 85%. And then there is also a little bit of the false alarm on the distractor. So there is going to be false alarm a little bit to the right. So that compared to the blue, it degrades to the right. So D prime now becomes three or area that the curve lower than, uh, you know, one, you know, perfect uh, performance. It's not perfect, okay? And then let's come back to the masked version of the performance. So masked version, we have zero hit, and so zero uh, false alarm, so it's here. And this is actually ambiguous. Ambiguous in the sense that, you know, uh, if you have an extremely high threshold, you can't tell whether this point is uh, consistent with D prime of four or three or two or one or zero. So this itself doesn't say anything, okay? However, uh, the recognition memory starts to tell you something a bit more. So here, mask and the distractor had a little bit of the heat and this little bit of that photo uh, uh, alarm. So uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, around here. But the uh, important thing is uh, this fourth choice performance. Here, the mask stimulus was always presented. And then half of the time people said uh, yes, half of the time people said no, corresponding to half of the time hit, half of the time false alarm. And that locates in here. And that um, unambiguously uh, makes it possible to, uh, co uh, you know, uh, for us to conclude that masked performance is D prime of zero or 50% uh, area under the curve. That is the chance performance, okay? So uh, under this condition, what uh, it, uh, we can say is that there is no um, there is no dissociation between the phenomenology and the behaviors. So when they uh, say that they saw it, you know, the visible, you know, through the verbal report of seeing, oh yes, lion, no, and so on. You know, here, the performance was also perfect, okay? So participants phenomenally saw the target and performed very well in the visible condition. And then if it's strongly masked like this, then they also do not say that, uh, you know, I saw it, okay? So uh, they deny seeing, and also the performance was also a poor chance. So there is no dissociation. However, there is, uh, the, the reason why this uh, paper was published in Nature Neuroscience is that uh, it is uh, very interesting and interesting in the se uh, several ways. So here they use fMRI and uh, 2001 was a you know, very cutting edge kind of uh, situation, okay? And then to, and their uh, ingenious you know, idea was to compare this neural response using the comparison between um, not only the mask itself or uh, visible world itself, but the subtraction between this pathway, uh, visible and the present 
minus visible absence this pathway and then that they define as the response to the visible and then in in a sense they subtracted out the neural response caused by this or transients between this you know uh, mask and not not uh uh mask offset or mask onset transient okay all of these are assumed to be equal and then they subtract it and the here again masked present minus masked absent this pathway minus this pathway was subtracted and then that's called masked response and without doing this if you were to do this visible pre present minus masked present the problem is that you know uh, the condition between this or that is not equated physically so uh, this is a uh, kind of a thing that is very important for the neural correlates of consciousness. We are going to talk in uh, from the next week and so on, that we want to minimize the physical distance as much as possible, but uh, extract the largest subjective difference. And here is the one way of doing it. Uh, making sure that many things are equal between the control condition versus critical condition and then generate the largest difference in terms of the subjective experience. You might say that, you know, in the end, you know, if you do subtraction like this way, still there is a huge difference in terms of st uh, stimulus uh, uh, difference, but, you know, that's not, there wasn't, uh, you know, um, sort of that, uh, too critical to be uh, rejected in that time. And now it's uh, crit criticized, uh, quite a bit in the literature, but uh, you know, uh, this is still a great uh, paper on its own. Okay, so now um, after doing this double subtraction, what they found was that the first, in the case of the visible world, they uh, generated, first of all, lots of uh, visual cortex activity and also parietal cortex activity, as well as the frontal uh, uh, cortex. This is frontal, this is parietal, and this is the visual. And uh, the, these are the uh, glass brains of the Sagittarius slice, and then finding that the largest response is this, you know, uh, first form uh, gyrus uh, or world area we are going to talk about next week. And this is the horizontal slice at each of these you know, height. And then you see um, all these, you know, different level of the activation uh, encoded in this p-value. So the p-value of red here is extremely significant, red one and then purple one is uh, weaker, okay? And then uh, if you focus on this uh, first form gyrus response and then make a time course of this subtracted, you know, presence minus absence, what you see is that the, the uh, bold response uh, signal increases like around 5% up to uh, five seconds, up to two to three, uh, uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 percentage increase in bold signal. It's very significant and strong in terms of the fMRI literature. And then in the case of the masked world, uh, they found this visual cortex and a little bit of something here, but uh, it's not uh, significant. Here, uh, the p-value is uh, much, much lower. So, uh, you know, 0 0.02 is uh, in the fMRI literature considered as just a noise because you're measuring many, many voxels at the same time. But uh, the, uh, around here, the uh, world form area, because this area is uh, same location as the visible world condition, we had a high prior hypothesis that we should see something over there. So uh, relatively weak uh, activation here should be considered as uh, significant. And uh, something like this, we might uh, talk in the later lecture, uh, a bit of the statistics. But anyway, um, so this is, uh, you know, are considered as uh, significant. And the time course of this uh, world form area for the masked world condition, again, it's a subtraction, okay? not the masked world response itself, is above chance here, above zero. Okay. So, 
just to uh, give you a bit uh, of the clear our view. So here's the um, magnified version. So this, you know, uh, fMRI response shows some delays since the time of the onset of the stimulus. It peaks around four, uh, four seconds to six seconds, and that's the case here. And here, the response is about this you know, uh, first form area. And then non-conscious is above, you know, zero, very, okay? So that's the uh, upshot of this uh, uh, paper, most important uh, finding. But you might ask, so are these weak activation real or not? In the end, you know, the behavior experiment we first uh, reviewed very carefully shows that, you know, subject denies seeing it, first of all, and then the behavior performance also showed that it's completely chance in the first choice, uh, you know, uh, task. So why do we need to believe that this is not a noise or maybe the leftover of the activation from the, you know, visible uh, condition, which is still the case, but, you know, we don't talk uh, much in the lecture. So uh, to back up this uh, uh, claim, uh, they did uh, the same experiment, but using the EEG. And in uh, cognitive neuroscience or conscious ex uh, consciousness research in general, this type of uh, convergent evidence is always important. And that's why uh, I ask you to um, do this general club and then uh, look at the same kind of phenomenon, but similar uh, across similar studies. Uh, every study, uh, changes slightly different kind of conditions, but if the like, uh, measurement or conditions are still pointing to the same conclusion, it's likely that we can believe it more. And here they did the uh, same experiment uh, using this, you know, uh, sandwich masking of four conditions, visible uh, and visible blank, masked present, masked absent, and then subtracted, and then show this, you know, uh, EEG in uh, 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 time, over the time. And as you see, um, you know, the response location is quite, quite blurry here, okay? And that's what I saw, uh, told you in uh, uh, like uh, previous uh, weeks, EEG does not have a very good spatial uh, resolution. But what it has is this, you know, a very good uh, temporal resolution. So here you see that the, the peak of the response is here in the case of the visible first, Roughly visible a visual cortex at the um, back of the head uh, in 156 milliseconds. Okay, visible present minus visible absent shows the biggest response around here, and then the second peak comes here, and the positively and the negatively here, frontal and the back around 244 milliseconds. Okay, it's a millisecond both, and then. Finally, 476 milliseconds, you know, well after things disappear and people are probably trying to make sense of what it was, uh, parietal areas tend to have a very strong response. And in the case of the masked condition, masked presence minus masked absence, you see it's very similar level of activation or the, the pattern of activation, but the units are different. So this is plus, 0 0.6 microvolt, and this is plus two microvolts. So it's roughly 10 times, uh, 10 to, you know, three to 10 times bigger difference. But around the same time, 172 milliseconds. Okay, so this is roughly the same time, and around the same time, but now 244 milliseconds, then this becomes pretty much like noise. You know, you don't see very strong activation. And then same as, same goes for two, uh, 476. There is something, but it's much, much weaker. You know, here it's a 3.5, this is 0 0.6, okay? And, uh, you know, the uh, priority or the location is not that, you know, same here and here, and then here and here. So that their claim is that, you know, initial response at 172 or uh, below, it's weaker, but uh, the topography-wise, it's similar and also uh, significant. So here the claim is that if you use EEG instead of uh, fMRI, we can see a relatively reliable activation by the masked words in the beginning 
of the trial, which dissipates very quickly. And that explains why fMRI response is so short, uh, so, so weak, but uh, located at the location of the uh, vis uh, visual cortex. But still, uh, you know, uh, the, the conclusion that we can make from this experiment is that the mass towards does uh, seem to uh, elicit a uh, very weak response according to fMRI, but in the same location. And then uh, according to EG, it is a, a activity that is very short lived. And by the way, uh, we will discuss the implication of visible water condition in the later weeks. Um, in, uh, in uh, uh, effort to uh, explain this um, global workspace theory of consciousness. Okay. But you know, here, to th this week, we uh, focus most on the non-conscious um, uh, uh, activity and non-conscious behavior. So we are going to focus on the mass words. And that's basically very weak and short-lived. And the uh, question for us is that whether these types of the weak and short-lived uh, uh, response, uh, is there any kind of the behavior uh, meaning for that? And according to Fortask, again, you know, and the answer is clearly no. The weak and short, list, uh, with, um, short response does not have any behavior meaning. However, uh, um, these people, the hen uh, has been uh, very famous for uh, working on the priming. And the priming is supposedly uh, one of the most sensitive and specific way to tap onto this uh, non-conscious uh, process. Okay. And the idea here or theory here is that the um, so-called repetition priming um, uh, paradigm or repetition priming experiment can activate the same area of the uh, 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 invoked by this non-conscious stimulus, and then uh, it can activate such area before the effect of activation disappears. So as I mentioned, this effect is uh, highly localized in the world form area, and it's shortly. So the idea is if you activate again, before it disappears, then we should be able to see any kind of behavioral you know, uh, evidence. So what they did, was the following. So longer mask, uh, forward mask here, uh, 271 milliseconds. And then followed by 29 millisecond mask without any blank 29 milliseconds of a target. Could be a radio, could be a uh, cow or something like that, followed by another mask. And then uh, followed by the target, this is a target. This is mask, masked word. And then here the task is uh, to uh, say, and uh, in this case, um, um, uh, I think uh, the, uh, pressing the button, okay? Pressing the button, mouse click, left click or right click on uh, whether the target word was artificial or natural. And then they measure the reaction time for uh, uh, this task. And then what they found was the following on the bottom right, uh, bottom left of the video. So if the same word was repeated, like this way, radio, radio, then uh, saying that, oh, it was artificial, uh, was um, 605 milliseconds. It's very fast. And if it's different, it's uh, 620 milliseconds. So there is a uh, 15 milliseconds difference, okay? And then um, if it is the radio, radio in the uppercase, uppercase, there is this difference. But if it's small or a small capital or capital small, then this effect becomes slightly different. And still, uh, whether the same or different word makes a huge difference. Uh, I mean, it's not really super huge. 607 to uh, 617, so this is 10 milliseconds. So it's weak, but highly significant effect of uh, non-conscious processing. And uh, still uh, people cannot actually here uh, say that it was this, if you are asked about this in masked world, whether it was uh, same or different or 
what, uh, whether it was radio or um, lion to the fourth choice, to open the fourth choice, uh, the performance was again the chance performance, d prime of zero. So there, they basically showed that the very similar task and the very similar situation, as long as you activate the same location, we before, you know, before this activation by the radio, which is probably peaking at 140 milliseconds, the, uh, the target is then presented, maybe because the previously activated the radio sensitive neuron is already active, that uh, activation to report the OK radio was the artificial is faster. And that faster response results in this, you know, 15 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds, uh, regardless of whether this is a capital letter or, you know, small letter. So that's the priming uh, result. Okay. So in summary of this part of the talk uh, on the lecture, unlike the blind side situation, uh, normally, and uh, I just, you know, represent, I presented a Stan De Haynes, you know, uh, beautiful work, but uh, it is, uh, I would say it's uh, probably the, uh, by default. By default, strongly masked stimuli are not possible to even detect and also identify, and you can't remember and you can't discriminate about chance. And uh, accordingly, neural response for strongly masked stimuli are weaker and also short-lived. But the sensitive paradigm, such as the priming, uh, can reveal a little bit of the uh, uh, this advantage of this non-conscious processing. And this kind of study uh, paradigm is necessary to demonstrate these weak behavioral effects. Okay, that's overall very different from the uh, blind side situation. Blind side situation is much much more robust in a sense and uh, very puzzling. And that's what we are going to talk um, in the next video. <clears throat> okay, so um, now the second part uh, of the lecture is about the deep dive into the blind side. So compared to the normal uh, people's uh, non-conscious processing, blind side is quite puzzling. And uh, that's uh, even more a stronger reason to doubt the patient's report potentially, okay? Uh, before dismissing the blindside behavior, uh, which is actually very important uh, step towards uh, consciousness research, uh, we first need to uh, review uh, stronger evidence of blindside. And uh, uh, in particular, we are going to look at the primate model of blindside. And the uh, reason is the following. Uh, first of all, um, as I mentioned in the brain lesion uh, study overall, um, when this uh, type of the lesion, brain lesion happens is not super clear, as well as uh, when it happens due to the stroke or uh, trauma, like, you know, a portal going through this, you know, brain, um, it's very uncontrolled and which type of the neurons are damaged and which part, uh, particular part of the brain is lesion is very difficult to uh, uh, constrain. And also, uh, distant effect of the neural damage is also uh, uh, impossible to uh, exclude. And therefore, uh, it's very important to do the uh, monkey study and then constrain the uh, brain lesions uh, in space manner. And uh, just aside, uh, for example, in the case of the humans, uh, there are lots of cases uh, reported on the prosopagnosia which is the blindness of the face. Um, we, we will be talking about it in a couple of weeks. And initially they were um, uh, proposed as a damage to the particular area of the brain as a strong cause of this prosopagnosia. But uh, later studies also implicated that uh, uh, prosopagnosia may be the, uh, uh, this, uh, the lesion, uh, the, the phenomena caused by the disconnection between the face area to other areas. And things like that, is not possible to preclude in uh, just observing this uh, brain lesion patient. So we need uh, uh, this type of brain uh, uh, controlled brain lesion study for a uh, primate uh, study, a primate model to understand how human you know uh, system works as well as uh, to uh, um, provide a better treatment and also uh, 
a clinical care for uh, visual deficits in the, in the end for the humans. Okay. And also the temporal resolution wise, uh, when this kind of thing happened, it's uh, very difficult to uh, estimate in humans. Uh, most of the blind sides uh, patients were damaged in uh, really early in their life and then get tested after a very, very late in their life. And partly uh, because, you know, as the case of the cerebellum uh, patients, many people are more or less, you know, uh, functional in the, you know, everyday life. So they don't need to go to the hospital. Uh, in many cases so uh even though you know um you are for example blinded on the right side of the field you can still use the left side of the visual field to uh you know control your behavior and so uh you know after the initial um hospitalization they tend to be studied only late in the life okay uh and also uh, another important thing is that the primate uh because we don't have a you know at least we don't know whether they have a social incentive to you know, tell a lie and then become famous and then get paid and so on to be a famous patient. So, you know, that's uh, another important issue to think. You know, the motivation to lie is uh, less likely to be there in the primate. And also, uh, further experimentation of, you know, more controlled uh, manipulation of the brain lesions or recording from uh, many different areas of the brain is possible only under the um, primate uh, situation to understand the neural mechanism of the blind side. Of course, the disadvantage is that uh, we don't have a, a verbal communication to our uh, uh, monkey. So we need to have a very careful and clever experimental paradigm, but that's uh, possible. And then the training is also necessary for the uh, monkeys to understand the task. And that may itself change the um, uh, connections of the neurons and then uh, we might induce the blind side like behavior because of the training which is something that we will be discussing in two three weeks at a time okay so uh, let's uh, go back to the video of the Helen and this video was uh, taken by uh, uh, Nick Humphrey one of the uh, most important people who are who studied the uh, blind side in monkey and uh, this is an extended version of this uh, uh, Helen's behavior. Here, initially, Helen was uh, proposed, uh, you know, shown two stimulus, and then uh, if it's not moving, uh, she doesn't uh, notice it. But when it's moved like this, then now uh, she can actually uh, touch it. Okay, so that's a one first part. And then this is another part that uh, uh, I showed you in this short uh, clip where she explored the room without bumping into the object. And then uh, uh, here uh, she touched, but you know, uh, she couldn't actually uh, move, uh, uh, the, the, you know, interact with them in a meaningful manner. And, uh, you know, no matter what they do, it's uh, uh, possible to do. And then one thing you might have noticed as a sort of potential uh, explanation of why Helen can uh, do this type of the exploration is possibly through the echolocation. You know, uh, uh, there is an evidence in humans uh, that uh, uh, sound cue or uh, a feeling of the, uh, yeah, the sound, uh, you know, coming back from the room or object is uh, used as a sort of the uh, cue to uh, avoid the object. And here, you know, because it's a mat, so it's very difficult to imagine something like that, but, uh, you know, uh, that's one possible uh, solution. And uh, Nick Humphrey played always a white noise outside uh, uh, behind this kind of experimentation. So that uh, type of uh, auditory uh, cueing is uh, unlikely to be um, the reason. And then now I'm going to skip the video a bit. And then to further uh, evidence that you know she is not using the auditory cue, this is an important part of the video. Okay, so there are three glass plate uh, here and then here and then here. It's invisible, but you know, acryl, you know, plate is there. So it's invisible for even us because it's transparent. And uh, if the Helen is using the sound as a cue to avoid object, uh, she should be able to avoid this, but let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, so as you saw, she bumped into this, you know, glass. 
okay? That means that, you know, at least in this particular video footage, um, suggests that, you know, she is not using the sound localization to avoid the object, but rather using this visual cue and then find that, you know, oh, there is something, so oh, she needs to avoid. And, uh, you know, every time this uh, experiment is done, you know, the location of the object is moved around. So she can't also use this in the memory to uh, guide her behavior. Okay. Now back to the lecture. All right. So, um, as I said, you know, white noise in the background that, you know, they are disabled by echolocation and also, uh, uh, you know, the invisible uh, transparent or low contrast stimulus is not visible to her. So before going further to the blind side behaviors, I, I want to uh, go into the, a little bit of the brain uh, neuroscience. So this is a comparison of the size of the brain in human, monkey, and mouse. And in human, um, roughly speaking, the extent of the human brain is roughly like 15 centimeter from front to back, and then uh, 10 to uh, 12 centimeter uh, from top to the bottom. That's a co uh, cortex, brain cortex, okay? And that contains uh, roughly 20 billion neurons or um, 10 to the 11 neurons in it, as I said before. Okay, and um, so the monkey brain is uh, roughly like five centimeter from uh, front to uh, back and then three centimeter from top to the bottom, roughly one third of human uh, brain. So um, the number of the neurons are also um, roughly 10 times uh, fewer. And this is the cerebellum part and the uh, visual cortex is roughly this amount and the prefrontal cortex and somatomotor cortex and parietal cortex is around here. Okay, so um, compared to human, um, the visual part of the brain is uh, bigger in a sense. And uh, uh, also important thing to notice is that uh, um, in the uh, primary visual cortex, which is the uh, location uh, critical for blind sight, is uh, also uh, slightly looks a bit different. Here is the lateral view. This is a lateral view. This is the lateral view of the brain. So looking my head from this side and then uh, on the surface and then uh, it's really the back tip of the brain here. That's um, just the primary visual cortex. And most of the main part of the visual cortex actually goes inside into the brain and called the calcarine sulcus that we are going to talk next week. And then this along this calcarine sulcus and the fovea is around here. And then periphery is here that we are going to discuss uh, today towards the end. What, uh, next week. On the other hand, the macaque uh, is uh, on the lateral view. There is a fovea already here. And then the periphery is uh, going towards there and then in the medial band. So that's a bit, you know, uh, reversed compared to the human. This is a medial view or sagittal view of the brain. And it's a bit different. The fovea uh, uh, periphery is reversed. Okay. All right, so then um, just to uh, uh, remind you about this uh, terminology, three ways, which is important to understand, you know, how uh, we navigate in this brain space. Uh, coronal or frontal space, uh, slice is cutting of the brain in this way, okay? Sagittal and medial is uh, cutting the brain in this way. And then horizontal is this way, okay? Uh, parallel to the ground. And here's the uh, uh, Koe and the Storics, uh, blind sand monkeys in a more detail. This is a uh, first of uh, their um, significant paper in 95 in Nature. And there uh, they studied four monkeys. Uh, one of them is a control monkey, which was studied further on in, uh, and published in 2002. The one that uh, we, um, I introduced last week. But here, this in 95 uh, paper, they uh, uh, compared the three already blind side of the monkey versus control. 
And in this blind side operation, what they do is, uh, so this is an uh, important figure to uh, understand what they do. So they cut the primary visual cortex, which is around here, okay, by lobectomy. And then um, this one is this section around here, and this is a coronal section, okay? And then, um, so they literally cut the left side of the brain. And uh, by the way, I actually made a mistake here, so I'll change it, but the left and the right is reversed. And the left side of the brain here uh, is looking like a hole here. That's because um, the, they, this you know, slice is made at this number two. Okay, so at the tip here, the visual cortex is removed and that appears on this you know, black hole. And then this is a uh, brainstem and cerebellum and this is the intact right hemisphere. Okay, um, so they cut the left hemisphere of this monkey. Uh, visual, uh, visual cortex uh, quite a bit. And here's the uh, schematic for the uh, 2002 version. So just to give you an, again idea, the back of the head is sliced like this up until, you know, uh, four uh, foremost you know, slice of the visual cortex. And if you arrange uh, this slice uh, 1.25 millimeter apart, it looks like this, you know, uh, arrangement. And uh, you can see the cortical folding at each slice. And all these, you know, blackish, you know, um, uh, part is the so-called layer four neurons uh, 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 staining. And these uh, areas uh, that looks slightly darker compared to other areas, uh, because I, I made it transparent, it's a bit difficult to see. But the uh, uh, V1 area is uh, very distinct in terms of the density of these neurons. And uh, uh, when you do this uh, anatomical staining, it looks darker. Maybe you can see it clearly here. So here it's very dark, but from here it, it's less dark. Here it's really dark and then it becomes less dark. And then here darker and again. So this darkness of these uh, cells or band of the cells are used as a marker for the boundary of the V1. And um, that's the one of the reasons why, that, that's the reason why V1 is called a striate cortex, uh, which we'll go in next week. So um, this uh, 2002 paper, not only uh, compared the four um, uh, human patients, but also uh, Rosie, who uh, participated as a control experiment, which was a, ex a control subject in the 95 paper, and subsequently in this paper acted as a blind side monkey. So Rosie's control uh, before lesion X uh, performance was reported already before. Okay, so the Rosie basically did exactly the same experiment as the other human brain side patients. Uh, trained on this task before the lesion was done and then after the recovery from the lesion, uh, six months later, they were tested like this. Here, uh, the format of the presentation is slightly different from the human uh, counterpart. So in the case of the Rosie, uh, she, compare, uh, she was tested with a normal hemisphere, the, left side and the right side separately. And because, you know, we couldn't ask her to do the Baba report for whether they saw, whether she saw it or not, uh, this is both localization performance. Okay, so this is the localization. Accuracy and the 50% is the chance performance. And as you see that when the contrast is 5% or anything above, then the performance of this localization is always 100% accurate. On the other hand, the blind hemiphile, she was very good at the highest contrast, like here. Uh, the localization of the things is almost like perfect, and it degrades, and, but still it's all above chance up to 30%, and then it becomes finally you know, chance performance at 20%. And so what they did was this uh, follow-up experiment using this signal detection task, uh, three alternative allowed. So HK is another 
blind side patient who is absolutely a blind side. So in his case, unlike a GFI, uh, even when 99% very strong contrast uh, stimulus was presented in the blind field, he was able to do this localization, but could not say, did not say that I saw it. So the catch trial uh, like response here. So in none of this, you know, 99% trial, he said that I saw something. So response of, you know, third bottom that I didn't see anything is uh, what he reported. And here is the uh, normal control field uh, performance at 3%. And uh, he said roughly like 40%, 30%, uh, 30% uh, yes. And also this uh, uh, 5 or 20 or 35 or 20 is the, you know, the change of the proportion of the stimuli I explained last week. But in any case, you know, upshot is that the HK, regardless of the frequency of the stimulus, he just doesn't say I saw it for, for 99%. And the ROSI was very similar to HK in many respects. And here, uh, you know, 4% stimulus on a good field, you know, very bad, uh, very good performance of the, you know, detection. And then uh, I didn't see response is very high for 99% stimulus, almost never she reported I saw something over there. Okay, so uh, a little bit farther, uh, you know, recently all these things are again are replicated by many other uh, uh, people, group, at least uh, uh, Mr. Yoshida in Japan has done several uh, ex uh, extensive study in the detail. And here he shows the lesion of the um, uh, V1, mapping out exactly where the lesion was supposed to be uh, using um, more, you know, uh, modern technique of, uh, you know, MRI and CT and the visual per, um, uh, perimetry following up their um, co study after 20 years. And basically they found a similar thing. And then further, uh, uh, Yoshida extended the finding on, uh, and also more quantified it into this visually guided saccad paradigm. So here uh, the monkey was presented with a bright spot of the stimulus. Uh, but the, the spot of the stimulus itself changed the luminance. And in the case of the normal uh, field, uh, the contralateral to the, you know, uh, the normal field, uh, the location of this, you know, saccade is plotted as a, you know, dot in each trial. And as you can see, you know, each of the dot corresponds to one trial. So it's a thousands of thousands of trials. They are really, really accurate. Um, it's a five alternative eccentricity times, you know, five different uh, angles. So 25, you know, options, and they are almost always accurate. On the affected side, each of the color corresponds to this, you know, uh, target location. And you can see that, you know, um, when the monkey was presented with this, you know, invisible stimulus, but uh, asked to make a saccade to that location, it's actually quite accurate. Here, you know, this uh, is already quali qualitatively very, very accurate. And this is a histogram showing the um, target location to be always around here, 60, 30, 0, or 30, or 60. And then this normal field, uh, super threshold, or normal field, or near threshold, it's very accurate. And affected side, you know, there it's blurry, meaning that it's less accurate, but the peak, Locate, uh, locates almost the same as the target location of the stimulus. So that means that the, uh, even the affected uh, uh, saccade is very, in a sense, you know, accurate. And then compared to the near threshold case, where in some case, monkey just don't see it, you know, and then, you know, there is some kind of dispersion here. You know, uh, you can imagine that if you are shown something and you don't see it, then you can't even make a saccade. But in the case of the affected uh, uh, side on the blind uh, side monkey, presumably they don't see it consciously, but um, the um, eye movement is quite accurate and they don't behave like a near threshold version. So in summary, uh, this, uh, uh, this part of the uh, 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 lecture, I showed uh, uh, evidence that blind side behaviors are mirrored and evidenced in a V1 lesion monkeys as well, and it's replicated recently. The nature of the deficits are uh, reliably replicated. 
the spared behaviors are not only the localization by a touch, as you know, um, demonstrated in the blind side patients, but also saccharic eye movements. And uh, we are going to talk about these eye movements uh, in next week. And this is in, uh, this has an important implication about consciousness. So uh, uh, taken together with uh, Stan de Haines finding in the last part of the lecture, initial neural activity is not sufficient for consciousness because you know it can be activated by the you know uh, shown demonstrated by the EEG evidence, but uh, it's it may be sufficient to trigger and uh, 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 guide the behavior by the arm and the eye movements and that may be the one that is uh, leading to a blind side behavior. So they can move around and also uh, walk because the initial visual uh, response is intact. And then uh, these arms and the eye movements are using this transient uh, response. That's the potential explanation of the blind side. And we will go into the detail in the next week about this hypothesis. And uh, uh, next video, uh, we are going to go to uh, how to characterize non-conscious behavior. All right, so uh, how to characterize non-conscious behaviors. That's the topic uh, for this part of the lecture. So phenomenally, uh, in blind side, things are invisible, but the behaviorally, their uh, blind side uh, patients and monkeys performance indicate that um, there is a significant processing going on in the brain and they are using this visual information for their behavior. And uh, according to no, uh, the Haynes you know, demonstration, normally if phenomenology is uh, that uh, I don't see things, uh, then uh, the performance related to that thing, uh, for example, you know, grating or in you know, a word, we just can't use it for the performance. So um, usually phenomenology and the performance go together. And that's the Haynes finding. However, uh, Brian said, uh, there is a significant difference between these two. So the question now is that, uh, can we characterize phenomenology without, uh, 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 not by a performance per se? So the idea here is a metacognitive accuracy. The intuition behind this uh, approach is that uh, if we are conscious of a stimulus, then we should be able to guide our behavior flexibly by monitoring the degree of the visibility of the stimulus. Okay, so if you, if you know, or if you are conscious of something, you know that, and you can use that for your behavior. So the metacognition uh, is a um, uh, concept in the psychology uh, and the philosophy, and it is defined as an uh, awareness and understanding of one's own thought process. But here we are going to use this uh, uh, metacognition idea to um, distinguish between conscious versus non-conscious processing, as it says here. So the hypothesis here is that uh, blind side patients uh, should not be able to take advantage of high uh, accuracy in terms of performance in a betting situation. So they can't utilize the information that, they, that guides the behavior as long as they are claiming that it is not phenomenally um, experienced, okay? And the betting here is a much more flexible type of the behavior uh, rather than, you know, gun, uh, moving around or, you know, making a, a gaze and so on. So it's more uh, cognitively demanding and there should be some kind of discordance uh, between the disconnect between uh, non-conscious processing to the flexible behavior like a betting. And in particular, what we are going to look at is a post-decision wagering uh, paradigm. Uh, after saying I saw it or I didn't see it, uh, then we asked the patient to bet the money. And then we, if the patient is correct about you know, the decision, and if they get uh, if they were betting higher money then they can get uh, you know double the amount of the betted money okay so if patient has this incentive to uh, maximize their you know uh, money account or you know reward account you know in the case of the baby or animals um, this kind of idea can be actually uh, utilized in fact so if there is a motivation for these you know uh, participants to maximize the reward then Utilizing any hint of your own behavior, behavior performance should be utilized for the uh, wagering of betting. 
That's the hypothesis. Okay. And then in the uh, blind side patient case, a GY, uh, uh, this paper in engineer science uh, tested this um, uh, explicitly. Here they uh, actually you know, tested many bunch of different kind of you know, uh, situation, but uh, in particular, important thing is that uh, three conditions, 0 0.2 super threshold for the visual you know, uh, hemifield and uh, uh, sub threshold for the blind field. So this one, 0 0.2 is the one GY cannot uh, say that uh, I saw it, but can always um, you know, loca localize it uh, accurately, okay? And then 90, uh, 0.96 is a super threshold for the blind uh, threshold, a uh, blind field. So GY, remember, it, he is a uh, relative uh, blind side. So if the contrast is really high enough, then uh, it looks almost like a super threshold uh, visual stimuli. And in fact, the results of the betting behavior for the 0 0.2 super threshold and 0 0.96 for the super threshold of the blind field is exactly the same. But the point is, what happens in the 0 0.2 sub threshold for the visible uh, blind field? So this is a you know a first uh, summary of their uh, result. First, uh, the x-axis is the performance of this localization or some kind of uh, false choice task. Okay. And then the performance uh, um, chance, performance is 0.5, 50%. And then both in super threshold situation or sub threshold situation, uh, the accuracy is around 70 to 85%. So this task is moderately difficult and not really perfect, but it's definitely above chance, 50%. And then the important thing is this wagering. Okay, wagering of the percent advantages, meaning that uh, here they um, pre uh, uh, preliminarily define that the percent advantages betting as high wager, uh, doubling, you know, uh, betting two dollars or two pounds, uh, depending on where you are, upon correct pa performance. Okay, if you are correct and then you bet two dollars, it comes back as four dollars. And if you are fail, if, if you you know are mistaking, then your two dollar gets lost. On the other hand, if you are making a mistake, then you still need to bet, and you can bet lower amount, which is one dollar or one pound. And then if you are uh, correct, then you can get you know double the money, two dollar. But if you are incorrect, then you lose one dollar. So the advantageous betting is that you know two dollar upon correct and one dollar upon incorrect. And uh, if you analyze it that way, this super threshold case, blind side patient was uh, actually highly advantageous, corresponding to the hypothesis that you know, he is trying to maximize the money reward. On the other hand, if in the case of the sub threshold, he is below 50% in terms of a percent of advantageous betting. And this mainly comes from the fact that, you know, despite the fact that he is actually correct, he tend to bet low. And that's the one that goes into, you know, below 50% advantageous, you know, wagering. But if you are astute, then uh, you might find that, you know, um, so th this is first uh, summary of this result. Despite good behavior performance, you know, x-axis, GY did not bet advantageously when he was correct. Uh, and that was, you know, this part, you know, white part. However, there is a possibility of the criterion shift, meaning that, you know, when uh, GY is tested on the blind uh, field, he just don't feel confident in any case. And if that is the case, he would just, you know, bet low, 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 low all the time. So that corresponds to the sort of signal detection paradigm of saying, no, 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 I didn't see it at all, or yes, yes, I saw everything. Uh, that's a sort of the uh, opposite end of the ROC curve. You know, it doesn't give us any kind of, you know, clue about the discriminability. You know, it's just ambiguous at the, you know, uh, starting and the, uh, ending. So that's what we are going to uh, take a look with the um, improved version of the metacognitive accuracy uh, uh, method. So uh, to rule out the criterion shift account of the uh, account, uh, what we are going to introduce is this so-called type two signal detection analysis. Okay, this is uh, not only 
useful for the consciousness research, but also in other types of psychological research. So uh, you might want to understand this. So usually a type one ROC analysis, um, there is an observation interval, either signal or noise present, and then uh, people or a machine or you know anything can make a decision about whether signal was present or noise was present, or signal was present or absent. And in the case of a type two analysis, what instead of um, this uh, uh, observation and decision kind of you know uh, you know dichotomy, what we do is to lump together this one set of the response signal and the response as one thing and then consider it as correct or incorrect trial and then followed by the confidence interval a confidence rating judgment and that could be in the case of the wagering it's either high or low wager and then this is a discrimination of the correct or incorrect on your own so it's a accuracy of the monitoring of your process okay and how it works is uh, as follows. First, you define hit and the correct rejection as correct because you know both of them are correct according to this you know uh, framework. And then uh, define false alarm and miss as incorrect. And then uh, define the uh, confidence or wagering response as yes if it's high and low, if it's low. Then uh, interpret the task as, uh, can we detect the correct you know, response in ourselves by high or low judgment? Just to um, give you again an idea, in the type one analysis, we had this you know, stimulus and then response uh, matrix and then yes or no, present or absent, yes or no, and we called this one as a hit and then this one as correct rejection okay hit and the correct rejection and then these becomes now the correct to incorrect axis of correct here and then incorrect here so these two becomes here and then false alarm and the miss here response yes for stimulus no and uh, stimulus yes and the response no miss both comes into here of the incorrect trial and then now uh, define the confidence or wagering of high or low so this is a second order matrix here and then correct the trial followed by the high wager as second order hit and uh, incorrect trial followed by low wager as correct rejection Okay, and then for the salam and the miss. So basically, by relabeling all the information that is available in the standard uh, experiment, as long as we have a confidence rating or wagering, we can do this type two analysis. Okay, this is a bit complicated, but that's um, the uh, idea of the type two signal detection analysis. Okay, so here's the response uh, or results of the uh, GY's performance in this task. In the sub-threshold situation, so he says he can see it, and uh, in the you know, right hemp field, uh, uh, Brian side, you know, hemp field. First thing you notice is that among 200 trials, you see that the, on the correct trials uh, dominates. You know, he can discriminate between you know A or B. You know, um, in some sense okay and he make a mistake roughly 60 percent uh 30 percent of time so it's a 70 percent correct and 30 percent incorrect on the other hand he gives a high wager and the low wager in the correct trials you know high wager should be much much higher than low wager in this case if he knows he's correct but it doesn't appear to be that and also, in the case of incorrect, he should low, uh, wager low. And no, uh, he should never wager high if he knows what he's doing. And it's a bit higher here. But see that, you know, if there is an overall bias towards a low wager here, then uh, it may be the result of this, you know, a bias in the response. So we can't uh, uh, exclude this possibility of the criterion shift. 
So what we will do? Now the type two analysis. We uh, first recategorize this, you know, um, correct and incorrect trial as a, as if stimulus present and stimulus absent trials. You know, that table contents doesn't change. And then the high wager is now present response and the low wager is absent response. And then I saw it and I didn't, um, basically refers to, I know I was correct. I don't know whether I was correct, okay? And then if you do that, then this becomes a hit, this becomes correct rejection, and this becomes false alarm, this becomes a miss. And then you do the same kind of analysis as before. And then that's uh, hit, miss, false alarm, correct rejection. And then type two hit rate becomes now among 140, uh, 141 uh, present trial or you know uh, incorrect trial, he gave a high wager 67 which is 0.48 okay that's a hit rate type 2 hit rate and a false alarm rate is among 59 stimulus absent or incorrect trials he gave high wager in 23 uh, trials and that's 0.39 so this ratio of hit rate versus false alarm rate is what uh, our roc analysis deals with so this is uh, now you should be familiar with this ROC curve, percent of uh, false positive, uh, or it's called also sometimes one minus specificity and a, uh, a percent of the true positive or uh, hit rate or sensitivity. So this sensitivity and one minus specificity is something that is also utilized in psychology uh, or um, other types of the population uh, effect and uh, uh, yeah. So uh, other field as well, okay. Anyway, so the type two hit rate and type two false alarm rate, if you plot it here, uh, then that rockets here, you know, 48% and also roughly like 38%. Maybe it's more, uh, a little bit more to the left, somewhere around here, maybe. And then uh, that corresponds to uh, the sort of um, type two, ROC curve, uh, if you do it, you know, across many different, you know, uh, experiment and then change it. And then that roughly corresponds to D prime equals zero or area under the curve for type U, um, type two AUC to be 0 0.5. Whereas that type one AUC is here, meaning like D prime of maybe 1.5 or something like that. And then uh, AUC is also uh, area under the curve is 0 0.7 also. So that discordance between type one and type two is you know, uh, possible to calculate here. And then if there is a significant discordance like this, we can conclude that, oh, so this is uh, qualitatively, and uh, not only qualitatively, but quantitatively, we, we can show that um, dissociation of conscious versus non-conscious using the metacognitive accuracy. So in summary, in this part of the video, uh, I explained the phenomenal and the behavioral dissociations in the um, brain side patient and the monkey can be described as loss of phenomenal vision by trusting their report and also other types of the uh, task performance. And then still residual behavior performance, uh, in particular the uh, eye and also uh, eye movements. However, this information that guides this residual behavior is inaccessible for the metacognitive accuracy. And when it can be established, then we can say that you know, this is like a blind side behavior, you know, strong uh, behavior without phenomenal vision and uh, its information is inaccessible, okay? So that's the, uh, uh, the way to distinguish conscious versus non-conscious processing. And then the last part of the video this week is going to talk about uh, 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 visual uh, uh, systems uh, to explain blind sight. Okay, so uh, this uh, final part of the this week's lecture uh, is trying to get to the uh, visual system. Uh, the question here is that how it's possible that the information in the brain is consciously experienced and um, accessible for further reports. In some cases, like the Haynes visible case, but 
it's also uh, not the case, um, like, you know, um, in the case of the prime side or a priming effect of the, the standard study. So to address this question, uh, what we need to do is to look into the architecture of the visual system and then uh, to consider how that relates to conscious experience. And this overall uh, moves towards the study design or uh, framework of neural correlates of consciousness. And that's going to be uh, the main topic for this week and next, next week. So let's get started with the eye. Um, so I, um, as you might already know that the lights are coming from this direction. Uh, uh, this direction uh, from up and then up. Uh, your iris uh, restricts the opening of this you know, um, uh, eye part uh, lens. And then um, uh, all of these uh, light goes into a uh, straight line and then uh, 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 focused onto one particular part of the you know, uh, retina outside of here. And then this is a lens and so on, okay? So for our purpose, uh, the most important uh, component within the eye is the retina. And uh, the retina starts uh, the uh, visual processing by catching the light uh, photons through photoreceptors. And the photoreceptor consists of cones that are responsible for color vision, as we talk about today, and then rods that are responsible for the night vision. It responds to the low uh, intensity of the, uh, uh, the light. And that's uh, what you can see in um, this area, okay? And uh, this elongation is the uh, part of the rods and the cones. And then there are some layers of the intermediate processing, such as uh, bipolar cells and amacrine cells. And in the end, uh, it generates, uh, uh, it leads to this uh, retinal ganglion cell layer around here. And then that is the first neuron that you encounter within the visual system that uh, com uh, generate the spikes. Up until here, all of the computation within the retina is uh, analog. And this retinal ganglion cells make a spike all on them and then uh, transmits the information to the next layer of the uh, visual processing. And the important thing uh, to note is that uh, the figure that I showed is in a sense inverted upside down. So um, it's kind of confusing, but the light coming from up and then the first thing you encounter is this axons axon bundles that is visible in this you know, uh, yellow area here coming out from this retinal ganglion cells. So these guys actually send an axons and then that's the one that first sees in a sense the light. And then there are lots of uh, pre -pre 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 -uh, processing layers here. And then the cones and the rods are located most close to the body in a sense. And uh, so light photons are dis, um, um, dispersed and also interfered within this you know, uh, internal structure. It's not optimal to uh, do the visual processing. The reason why this is an um, evolutionary mystery, and it doesn't have to be like this at all, actually. And uh, interestingly, uh, octopus indeed uh, has an, uh, in a sense, optimum kind of, you know, uh, uh, visual processing uh, architecture. So they, in their case, light comes here and then first, you know, cones and the rod like thing uh, uh, accumulates, the, you know, light information here. And then the retinal ganglion cell like structure pre uh, processes this, uh, information and then sends an output into this way. So nothing interferes from the light uh, lens and then photoreceptors. On the other hand, the vertebrates, um, the ones that have an, uh, spines, you know, uh, in the back, they have all this architecture of uh, initially uh, ganglion cell layer uh, that spikes, and then that sends an axon out from there, and then that uh, is followed by the intermediate, you know, structure, and then photoreceptors are located at the, you know, back. And the information or spiking our neural uh, transmission uh, uh, computation goes in this way. And so many of the stuff here uh, potentially interferes with the light source. Okay. All right. And as a result of uh, this architecture, 
uh, the vertebrate uh, species all have this uh, fovea uh, structure at the uh, um, you know, center of the vision usually. In the case of birds, uh, they have a uh, different location, but then you know, we will not talk about it. Um, the in, uh, highest uh, spatial resolution of the vision is attained in this uh, fovea region. And the reason that you see some kind of dip here in this schema, schematic is that uh, at the fovea, um, the, all these axons are uh, avoided so that you know all these um, uh, intermediate step of um, uh, that, that could interfere with the uh, cones and uh, rods are minimized. And as a result, uh, you, we have an, a better spatial resolution at the fovea or center of the fixation here. The definition of fovea, according to the Christoph Cox book in chapter three, is that the central part of the fovea, about one degree of visual angle in size, the width of your thumb at arm's length like this. And uh, it's around 1.5 to two, uh, 2 degree of visual angle. And it's specialized to ensure that the vision there is as good as possible. So the useful number to remember is this uh, uh, concept of the thumbnail at the arm's length is roughly 1.5 degree visual angle. And uh, now this study by Osher, Robert Osher um, shows that um, uh, he asked many students to do this kind of measurement and then found that the variance across the people uh, is very, very small. Thumbnail width, so everybody, pretty much uh, male or female, if you extend the arms like this, okay, if you extend up like this, and then that uh, width of the thumb, that corresponds to one degree of visual field. And that's where you can see and we can read, um, we can perceive everything best in a sense. Okay, so the distribution of the cones and the rods across eccentricities are not um, are uniform. Here, eccentricity is defined as the angle from fovea. So fovea is always zero. And then uh, here, for example, the light coming in here, and that's roughly like 15 degree or so. And then here, 14 degree is looking at something like this. So, you know, as I said, the thumbnail at the, you know, arm's length, that corresponds to, you know, the projection of uh, 1.5 degree, and that corresponds to this dip around the fovea. And then uh, here, one to uh, zero to 1.5 degree here, you see that the, the density of the cones are very, very high per square meter, okay? So given a pa uh, you know, particular area, number of the cones that you find is um, potentially up to 150,000 uh, cones around the fovea at the you know, direct fixation here. And then it uh, degrades, uh, you know, uh, its density de decreases quite a bit as, uh, as you go to the uh, periphery. But it doesn't reach to zero, okay? That's also uh, important. It's always above zero. But after, you know, uh, 1.5 degree of fovea of direction, uh, you know, region, it uh, severely decreases. On the other hand, the rod increases. So the uh, night vision is uh, compensated by the uh, rods, although we don't see uh, much color from the rod. Another important thing that we will not go into the detail for this week, but uh, next week we will go into this uh, is this blind spot. So roughly 20 degree to 15 degree or so. Um, here, the other side, nasal side of the you know eye has this um, axon bundles that goes out from uh, the eye to the LGM. So this you know uh, gray part. Gray part is the one that um, uh, indicates the axon, and these occupy quite a bit of this region. And around here, we don't have any photoreceptors. And that's why you see this you know, uh, drop of the density into zero. So that's called a blind spot in the retina. And a blind spot, we don't usually see it because the other side of the eye, uh, see the information over there, and that is compensating. 
So the natural conjecture is that, you know, if you uh, close one eye, then you see that blind spot, but it, phenomenologically, you will not see it directly. And uh, why is that? That's a question that we will discuss uh, next week. But anyway, uh, uh, coming back to the, um, another important phenomenological observation is uh, the following. So uh, just uh, let's get uh, this, you know, phenomenological inspection, okay? Uh, just try to extend your arm uh, uh, from the display and then adjust the size of the, uh, you know, um, distance from yourself to display to, so that, you know, this thumbnail uh, image aligns to yours. And the, here, roughly, for me, this is a kind of a distance that aligns this, you know, thumbnail. Okay. Okay, now you are ready. Okay, so what I want you to do is to introspect what you see in the periphery. So just keeping your you know, thumb at this you know, thumb figure and then closely uh, look at all the, you know, uh, without moving your eyes from the uh, thumbnail, can you see all the colored dots? really clearly, or can you actually uh, locate the location of the dots, you know, uh, in a nice way? Can you count the number of the rows of the uh, dots and the columns of the dots? And then uh, can you see the red and the green uh, very clearly in the far periphery? Okay, that's the first question. Okay, without uh, asking, uh, answering to this question from my side, then um, I want you to, I think or introspect. What did you see in terms of color outside of the phobia? As I said, the phobia is around your thumb, okay? And the co uh, cone density that is responsible for the color decreases quite a bit. And then uh, if you saw anything clearly, sharply, richly, that's kind of interesting because the color, uh, the color uh, vision supposedly is uh, supported by the cone is decreasing quite a bit. And how rich, how sharp, that's, is it actually corresponding to the expected uh, level of the degree of the decay of the cone density? That's the question. And some of the philosophers, uh, such as um, uh, Dan Dennett, uh, claims that, you know, based on this uh, retinal density of the cones decline, everything in the periphery if you think that you know the color is there it's just illusory and that's a philosopher's statement okay and we as a scientist we want to uh, test whether this is empirically true or not but it turns out that it's not super straightforward to test it so one more time now uh, i want you to do it again uh, align the uh, uh, finger here to the display and then look at this figure okay can you now uh, see the color of the red and the purple and the green and the blue in the periphery without moving your eyes. And also in uh, closer to the phobia. So now this time, what do you feel? Okay, and then um, I want you to, if you have time, uh, show this demo to your friends or family and then ask their also color experience. And uh, if you believe this, you know, cone density decrease corresponds to uh, the uh, color illusion of the periphery, then other people should also not see that color. But if there is something else, then uh, other people would also see that, you know, that color is there. But this type of the, uh, you know, uh, inspection, introspection is uh, just a first step. And we will discuss more into the detail to, uh, how we can now uh, uh, confirm this type of uh, phenomenological report or not uh, by more sophisticated task. Uh, one possible uh, uh, way is uh, the currently uh, uh, conducted experiment by Ariel in my uh, lab. And if you follow this link, uh, you will be uh, led to this uh, inquisit uh, website. And then if you uh, press a start, then the experiment will start. And it takes about 20 minutes to complete the experiment and we will be discussing the results in the later week. So I, I encourage you to do this, okay? 
So uh, in summary of the last part of the uh, lecture, a retina in the eye is a sheet-like structure with cones and rods distributed unevenly across eccentricities. And I also asked you to introspect your color experience by you know, uh, having this um, fingernail, uh, thumbnail uh, procedure. And we will discuss um, the implication of phenomenology further in the class and tutorials. And the, uh, um, the next couple of weeks will be trying to address um, not only the, how the blind side works through the visual pathway uh, discussion, but also what kind of phenomenological uh, report we gain about you know, color experience and why we can do that uh, based on more uh, detailed physiological uh, investigation of the visual brain. Okay, uh, until then, see you, bye-bye.